get into some shite. Hi, folks. How are you? Welcome to Apocalyptic. I'm your host, Rick, and um, it's a Monday show, which is kind of nice kicking off the uh, the week. Uh, how was your weekend? Did you have a good one? Mine was pretty good. So um, I think, well, let me just say this first. Let me get into this part first. Today is my wife's birthday. Hey! Um, so, I, you know, I um, I've known two what I would call just like straight out plain giving people in my whole life. And you, you know, I've, I've encountered more than two, but I've known personally two people, uh, my mother and my wife. Uh, I don't know if there's a connection there, but anyway, um, and if you've ever been around giving people, they can sometimes be frustrating because it's just like they never or rarely think about themselves. They always, it doesn't matter um, what situation that they're in, they're always looking to try to serve other people, right? So like my mother should have been a nurse my, and she was in a sense to my dad, but she just like constantly caring, constantly giving, constantly thinking of other people. My grandfather uh, at one point had a stroke and he was on his deathbed and people came in and checked on him, but my mother stayed in the room with him until he was gone. And it, was, uh, it wasn't her dad, but it was her, her stepfather, not stepfather, no, father-in-law, sorry. And she took care of him. She nursed him when his own kids, and I'm not saying they didn't care. They went about their life and popped in and checked on him and spent some time with him. But she nursed him, essentially, until he was gone. And that kind of um, focus on other people, to me, is just so foreign. And my wife is like that. So um, she, uh, my wife's always like trying to help people out. Her job, what she does every day, is she works for a hospital. And she's the uh, patient um, advocate. So when a patient has an issue with the hospital, they come to her. So she was, she works for the hospital, but she works as an advocate for the patient. So if the patients are really ticked off. And let me tell you, the patients are always ticked off and they, they come to her and her whole life is going to work and listen to people complain, uh, watching people throw things sometimes at her. You would never, you wouldn't believe the uh, level of rudeness and maybe you would of people uh, who are in the hospital. But anyway, uh, she, you know, cops have had to be called. And, uh, but I can remember, I think it was last year, uh, there was a homeless person who kept checking into the emergency room um, because it, it, he needed health care. That's the only health care he had. And um, this had been going on for a long, long, long time. And I think at times, I can't remember, I think maybe he just sometimes was faking it. He just needed the attention or whatever. But he had mentioned that he really wanted to go home. And we're in Atlanta, and he I think his home was like Seattle or Portland or something like that. He just wanted to get home. And my wife uh, arranged and made arrangements with other people, but made arrangements for him to get a bus ticket and go home. And he did. And I think he's probably a happier person, maybe. But it's just, you know... Um, I just, I'm always kind of in awe of people who focus and serve other people constantly. It's like, that's their life. I'm just not that. It's not in my blood. It's not how I made. And I, it has taken me 60 years of my life to get to the point where I realize spiritually life and just life in general life well life is spiritual let's I, i'm gonna argue that but anyway life is about serving other people 
you may not believe that, but if you stop and think about it for a little while, it will start making sense to you. And it took me this long to get to the point where I realized, holy crap, I know, you know, growing up as a Christian, I know that that's that, you know, Jesus said that stuff and you hear it in the church and, you know, serving other people. And all that. But I just thought, well, that's just a part of that's that's called being nice. You know, you're a Christian, you be nice. You stop at the stoplight and let people go before you, you know, even if it's illegal, you don't have right away. Sorry. Um, but you just, you know, you do nice things for people. That's what I thought. I always thought, but no, it's not about that. It's literally about serving other people because other people are you. That's the spiritual secret. I mean, Jesus said it. You do it to the least of these. You do it to me. And, and you know, in my mind, I'm just thinking, oh, okay, that's just metaphorical. He's using colorful language. No, no, no. It's real. When you get into spirituality, you realize we're all the same person. We're all the same person. And when you just serve yourself like I have done for 60 years, <laughs> you have cut off what it is what life is you've made life short you've made yourself separate and apart from everything holy crap that's a, just a revelation for me and I, again i knew that that was in there i just never know knew to the extent of of how important it was and i think that's what servers and people who um who um work their whole life just to take care of other people. That's the secret they know. I have a train coming by right now. It's the reality train, people. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, I feel embarrassed that it took me 60 years to find that out. I'm finding it out in so many ways now. I'm not being preachy. I'm not trying to be uh, uh, spiritual or religious to you right now. I'm just, it's just my life. It's what my eyes have opened up to. And I've always seen it in my wife. I've, we've been married for seven or eight years now. I can't remember which. But I just knew she was, she's just one of those people who will do what she can do to make other people's lives better. And we live in a society now where that has started to be um, looked at as a weakness. Even from people who aren't who are supposed to be servers i see it in like the church movement the evangelical church movement as a whole have started kind of putting that down serving other people um and and i think that's when you start losing your relevance in this world so anyway i i don't want to go off on too much on a tangent it is my wife's birthday i just wanted to say happy birthday to her and i'm trying to think of um what have you ever tried to give a present to a person who is a server a present to a person who thinks of other people but you can't because number one they don't want anything for themselves most of the time and if you ask them what they want it's almost always something to take care of someone else and then not only that, if you gave them money or cash or something that they can split up among other people, they will do that. They, If my mother won a lottery, $10 million, she wouldn't keep it. It would go to other people. She's got a note list. I know she made a list. You know, church gets 10%. Her grandkids get this. Her kids get, I'm, and then she's left with nothing. Maybe a pair of fuzzy house shoes. But she, she, she's got everything planned to give away. I wish that the remainder of my life can be um, dedicated to un, to really clicking into that and understanding. I don't. I'm not going to say I'm a selfish person. I do serve people in my way. Um, I'm a giving person. I like. I do believe in giving money when I have it. If someone asks, especially, I, I believe in giving. I believe in giving my time, my gifts, all of that kind of stuff. But I'm also a very self-focused person. And I don't mean that necessarily in a, um, a selfish way. Spiritually, I, I look within and I work within and I work with how um, spiritually I see what's going on in myself. And then when I see that, then I can kind of focus it outward. 
So I'm, I'm more than not focused inward. I think we need all of those people in society, right? We need people that are working on themselves. We need people who are serving others. But I think both sides have to do both things, right? So you, what's the, what's the whole reason of becoming a better person if you're not going to share that and if you're not going to help other people? So that's kind of where my life is going. Um, is and and I think my wife is the best example for me because I just always see her doing things and go, really? I would never have thought of that. Wow. Okay. Um, so happy birthday to her. I'm, uh, um, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me, uh, to meet her, uh, just as an example of being a, um, a good person in life. And here's the thing about servers. Here's the thing about people who help, um, is they get, they never get anything good. Now, obviously, like I said, if you give them something, they tend to give it away, but just time just they get taken advantage of a lot they will give give and give and instead of people turning around and giving back usually they just turn around and ask for more and i saw that in my mother's life forever it's just I, you just kind of want her to get hers at some point you know um she'll give she'll just dish out the food until it's all gone and she doesn't have a plate and you kind of want someone to bring her a plate um, so all I'm going to say is, and this is for me as well, uh, on my wife's birthday is, um, maybe really look out and give the, um, caring, serving people in your life, a special gift where you can serve them and make it personal so they can't give it to somebody else. I'm not saying they shouldn't let them keep doing what they're doing, but, um, they got to have some special stuff too. time. That's a good thing to share time. Cause you know, they can't cut that up. And they love that too. Um, and um, uh, something I've been thinking about is if I actually serve other people in the name of my wife, I think she would love that too. So that's a good birthday present, isn't it? Christmas birthday for servers. Um, I want to tell you, uh, so I did, a, I did a storytelling event this weekend at the gallery and it was fun. We had some great storytellers. Everybody seemed to have a good time. I think we're going to do it again, but I did realize, uh, I think my career is over my story. You know, I did stand up comedy when I was younger. I was in my thirties when I did it last. So wow. Almost 30 years ago, but I can remember the last time I did it. I was, I was actually on stage doing my set and I just remember thinking this is not fun anymore. I'm, I'm just doing the same jokes I always did, getting laughs and everything. But I just like, I, I don't like this anymore. And I don't know. It took me a while to kind of analyze why I didn't like it. And I believe when you do stand up, it's fun. If you have, if you're, if you're Jerry Seinfeld level, and maybe there's a different stand up comic that's a better reference than that now, but I'll use Jerry. Um, when you're like the master of stand up comedy, you, you have an act that you know is going to, just do so well you you can kind of coast and you can have fun it's just like my joke lots of laughter my joke lots of laughter but when you're a bottom level comic like me or like I was you're constantly trying to make your act better you're tr you know you get a lot of stuff that doesn't work but I just feel like the whole time that I'm on stage, it's just like you're you're trying to get approval. You need approval from the audience, and that's that's part of stand up. You have to have that approval, or it doesn't work. And when you when you detect that you're not getting some approval, um, it, it, it kind of there's a panicky feeling. And I, you know what? I'm at the age I don't need approval anymore. So <laughs> I just. I don't know. I remember when I was on stage doing my stories, I, I felt that feeling of just like, I want them to like me. I want them to approve of my story. And um, I didn't like that feeling. I was just like, you know, I don't need them to approve. I don't need that. But you, you do if you're performing, if you're in front of them. Podcasting is different. I love doing this probably more than I've ever done anything. And I just put it out. If you don't approve of it, you just shut it off. You go to another podcast and that's cool. You're allowed to do that. I do that. And that's fine. If you like it, then you subscribe and you listen to the next one. So, um, but I think, I don't know. I think my storytelling stand-up comedy 
career's over. I'm done. Not going to do it anymore. I, I'm not saying I won't speak in public. I might do that if called. <laughs> no one's calling. Hello. Speaking of calling, we do have a listener line, 678-348-0008, uh, for you to call and leave your message, leave your opinions, leave whatever you want to say. And then I'll put it on here. You can be famous. I'll put it on the show. Text that um, same line, too, if you don't want to talk. Uh, email me, rick at apocalyptic.com. Um, some people have been doing that. That's nice. I appreciate it. Follow me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube. You can listen to the shows on YouTube. And every once in a while, I'll put a video up there. I've been putting some weird videos. I apologize. I need to do some normal videos. I'm going to tell a story now. This is a story that I told. Listen, this is not a... This is not a uh, perfect story by any means. Uh, this is a story I wanted to tell for years. I've never never told it public until the other night. And, and uh, I'm going to tell it to you now. And it will be the last time I ever tell it in public. Not going to do it anymore. It'll be out there. <laughs> um, I didn't tell it because there's no way I could tell it and look good. It makes me look horrible. I look like a pervert. And you'll find out why. But here's the thing. I was young. Uh, I used bad judgment, I think. I think it's bad judgment, yeah. But I also think more people would do what I did and, and, and wouldn't want to admit it, okay? But still, just remember, <laughs> it's not going to make me look good. I, I'm very, I, I am a flawed person, and again, when I was young, you just do things when you're young. You probably would have better sense of doing now. So at this time, this was like the early 90s, all right? I was living in a city. I'm not going to uh, reveal the city for a lot of reasons, but it was a, a, a decent-sized city, and uh, I was married at the time. My first wife and I, uh, we, we moved to the historical district of this city, and we were renting a... A uh, three-story house, historical house, and I mean, it was great. It was nice. It was older house, and at the time, um, like in in the day, this community was where everyone wanted to live. It was like a big fancy schmancy place, and it had lost some of the sparkle, but it was sort of trendy, and a lot of young trendy people moved there, and so it was kind of cool to be there. So. We'd been there for a while, and there was a house in the corner that was up for sale, and one day we noticed someone had purchased it, which was awesome. So we had new neighbors, and uh, I was working at the time as a freelance graphic designer illustrator. Um, so, you know, <laughs> you don't make a lot of money doing that. We felt like we were uh, fancy schmancy because of the house we were living in, but we really weren't. It was kind of fun. And being young, you know, that's all you want in life. It's just the appearance that you're cool, right? Um, I remember one night I was doing some work in my studio uh, upstairs and um, finished everything up. Turn off the lights to, uh, to, to leave. And I noticed there was this blue glow coming through the window, my studio window. Just this weird little blue glow. I was like, what the heck is that? So I go over to the window, look through the blinds, and I notice I can see directly into the window of the house next door. Right? They don't have curtains up. They don't have blinds up. It's just wide open. Like, they don't care. And I notice there's a TV on. That's the blue glow. Someone's watching TV, I suppose. So I just, you know, my eyes kind of gradually um, adapt to the nighttime and I notice that there's a woman laying on the bed watching TV, just laying there watching TV like we do, but she's naked. All right. You got the picture. <laughs> now, this is where it starts getting uncomfortable. All right. This is where you start bringing out your judgments, but I'm just going to say I didn't do anything illegal. I'm in my house. I'm not a peeping Tom. I'm not going door to door, window to window. I'm in my own house, my own studio. I look out the window. They don't have curtains. They don't have blinds. There's no sense of privacy that they have. Right? 
If I had my windows open and I was naked in my studio, which might have happened two or three times, I can't remember, they could see me. So it's the same situation. Naked woman laying on her bed watching television. That's it. That's all that happened. There was no any weird stuff going on. No, um, nothing but that. Just ordinary. But still, when you're in your 20s, naked woman, it's pretty awesome. So I watched it for a little bit. And um, I guess to the point I felt guilty. And then I just quit. Just left. Next night, I'm working on my um, stuff. And... Uh, Close everything down. I notice again, blue glow coming through the window. Uh oh, I know what that means. Go there. I look through the window and I notice that uh, there is a girl laying on her bed, naked, watching TV. But this time, someone else is with her. Oh no. And it is um, naked woman number two. That's right, two naked women. Laying on their bed watching television. I mean, if you're if you're a young twenty something dude, is there anything better than free lesbian porn being popped piped right into your house? Obviously, I could have just not looked through the blind. Why would I not? I'm I'm asking you. Would you do the same thing if you knew? that you could look through your window and see two naked ladies on their bed? Would you not? I Don't say no. I don't believe you. So anyway, that was fun for a while. Every once in a while, I would watch naked ladies watching TV. And as things happen, that gets boring after a while. I mean, seriously, it just it's just naked people, right? You know, one day the uh, the devil kind of popped up on my shoulder, and the devil said, uh, "You know, I think you could see everything much better if you had a pair of binoculars, um, don't you think?" I was like, "Holy crap, that's true! I got no binoculars in the house, but if I had a pair, boy, I could see right in there very good." See, this is why I didn't want to tell the story. It's just it it doesn't make me look great. But that's what happened. So every day I started thinking about binoculars. Boy, I could really use some binoculars. And you talk yourself into things like, well, you know, what if I went camping? I might need some binoculars. So why don't I just go get a pair of binoculars? I'll just have them in the house and who knows what I'll see. So uh, that obsession just kept going, kept going. So finally I thought, all right, I got to do this. got to go. I'm going to go out and get some binoculars. But I'm not going to go get some new binoculars. I'm going to go somewhere and just maybe like a pawn shop. Why don't I just go to a pawn shop, buy a pair of binoculars, and I'll have them for anything kind of my binocular needs that I need. So uh, I immediately try to find a pawn shop. I go to the most remote pawn shop I could find. And I know when I'm outside walking and driving, everybody's looking at me because they know what I'm doing, right? It's like that felon's guilt that you have. You just know people know what you're doing and you're shame. I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed, but I'm still doing it. So I find a pawn shop. I go to the pawn shop. I go in and there's like three employees in there and they're all just looking at me as soon as I walk in. And I know they know. They know what's happening. They know what I'm doing. So I'm embarrassed. I know they're chatting about it back there. So they send an employee over. Um, it's a girl to make it much more uncomfortable, I guess. So she comes over. She looks like Marie, uh, Lisa Marie Presley, right? That's what I remember about her. And so Lisa Marie kind of shows me around the binoculars and is like, what about this one? What about this one? And I didn't want a, a really expensive pair of binoculars. I'm using it for seedy purposes, right? So I don't want to spend tons and tons of money. And so I find one maybe about 20 bucks and Lisa Marie rings me up and says, thank you, come again. And I leave. And I know when I leave, she knows. She knows what I'm doing. She knows what I'm doing with them. So I'm so glad to get out of there. Just get in my car, leave, get home with my binoculars. I put them away in the closet for a little while. Didn't want to think about it. <laughs> I'm feeling bad. Feel a little embarrassed. But again, devil pops up on the shoulder. There he is. Go get those binoculars. Oh, that's true. I've got 
My binoculars, all right. So one night I'm doing work upstairs in the studio. You know, done, turn out the light. Oh, there's no blue glow. Nothing, just black. Nothing coming through the window. Well, that's not cool. Next night, doing some work, turn out the lights. Still nothing. I, I went out and bought these binoculars special for this occasion, and there's nothing there. No one's doing anything. No blue glow. No naked ladies. What's happening? Third night. Doing a little work upstairs in the studio. Turn the lights out. <gasps> blue glow. All right. Coming through the window. I got my binoculars ready. I go over. Look through. Peek through the blinds. TV is on. So I put my binoculars up. I look at, you know, you got to get used to everything. I'm looking through everything in the room. I'm checking out their room, checking out the decor. Like, oh, I have that book. Looking around. I start getting like into the movie they're watching, get really caught up in the movie. And I'm like, wait a minute, snap out of it. Come on. So I look around, naked woman number one sitting there enjoying the movie. I think she had some popcorn. It's great. Move over to naked woman number two. I'm looking at naked woman number two. And I'm like, uh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Do I know her? Do I know naked woman number two? And I realize it's Lisa Marie Presley who sold me the binoculars at the pawn shop. It's true. It was her. I mean... You talk about a sign that you're going to hell. That's the sign that you're going to hell. So I put my binoculars away. Like, no more peeping. My peeping career is over. I cannot peep. I can't look out the window at people just walking down the sidewalk anymore. I'm in big, big trouble. So I that was it. I quit. No more peeping. Couldn't look anymore. <laughs> Eventually, they put curtains up. And blinds up. A good thing. <sighs> All right. I told you. Now you know. That's the story. I've had that story in just in myself for 40 years. I've wanted to tell it. But I can't. Because now everyone knows. I was a peeper. But I wasn't. I was in my own house. I was minding my own business. And I did mind their business a little bit. It's not illegal to look out your window. That's what I was doing. All right. There you go. Um, for those who think I might talk too much about spirituality, there's the opposite for you right there. A little bit of opposite thing. Well, I'm really glad that you're listening to the podcast. I hope that uh, story didn't turn you off from the podcast. We, uh, we do the show every Monday and Tuesday. No, every Monday and Wednesday. No, every Monday and Thursday. Yes. Monday and Thursday we do the show. Uh, occasionally the Thursday shows are really, really short um, if I don't have anything to say. But I like to touch base with you. Um, and uh, I'm going to have a birthday party tonight. My, my wife wants to make a cake, which she's really good at making cakes. So she's going to make her own cake. And I'm going to have a little party. I'm going to let her serve. She could serve me on her birthday. I got to do, I got to go out and find a good birthday present today, though. I have an idea what I'm going to do. Not going to say it because she, if she listens to the podcast, which she never does, if she listens to the podcast, she'll know. All right, friends. Thank you for listening. Thank you for discovering what a crazed pervert I really am. I see you.